Okay. Our guest today is my wonderful friend. I almost feel like calling you my brother-in-law, Tim. <laughs> Tim and I met 11 or 12 years ago when he started dating my amazing friend. We all lived in NYC at that time. And Tim had this ridiculous daily commute to Rikers Island, where he worked as a discharge planner, helping inmates plan for their release, a title he says is super sexy. I agree. <laughs> We'd all get together and cook and drink wine and hang out. And Tim would always fall asleep on the couch by like 8 p.m., but not just because he was tired from his commute and job. Uh, Tim was also training for marathons and ultra marathons. And he was, is the master at really maximizing his day. Like, for example, he lives on the West Coast. And when I wake up at 6.30 Central Time, I know he's been up and at his day long enough. He's about to make lunch or have round three of his famous oatmeal logs. I'm sure he's going to discuss with. <laughs> so, Tim is a um, Marine veteran. And recently he's earned his master's of science degree in sport and performance psychology. He's now married to my friend Devin and the dad to two beautiful boys. Tim's heart is gold and the entire time I've known him, he's been a living example of being motivated to improve ourselves and our careers, our sports, whatever they may be, and our lives in general. And the best part about Tim is he wants this for you too. Um, but there's one chapter I was dying to have Tim come on the show to talk about today. And that's when he worked uh, with an organization in LA literally helping underserved populations. Um, these are people experiencing homelessness, involved in substance abuse programs and reentry programs um, to help them get back on their feet. Tim, hi, thank you for coming on the show today. <laughs> thank you for having me, Linz. Super excited to, to be here. It's, it's very interesting that you have a podcast called Good News right? Because that's what I always have associated you with, right? It's oh. like, whenever you're in the room, it's like, it's fun. It's exciting. Like it's, oh, a, it's so always nice. good news. <laughs> Thank, uh, you. Thank you. So It's very fitting and just excited to be on the journey with you. Thank you, Tim. I'm so glad you're here. Um, before we get started, my first question uh, to prompt you to give us some good news. What's the most inspiring or encouraging thing you've ever heard, read, experienced? Take it away. Most it's, it's such a such a tough question. Uh, most inspiring, it, you know. I, I think of the day to day. I think of the big things. I think there's there's two to kind of set the stage. I think that there's there's two main books that I would that I would speak to mm -hmm. um, that are very different, but it's a similar theme. The one would be um, when Devin was pregnant with our oldest son. Um, first kid mm -hmm. we went out we want to get the books like are there books like what should we do and like Devin got these like info over baby <laughs> books and and I go out and then I get um like a very intense book called far from the tree uh and it was this book about um ordinary people mm -hmm. having children with extraordinary difficulties. Mm -hmm. um, so whether that was, you know, autism, schizophrenia, severe disabilities, uh, and it followed these families around. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's always like two sets of families. So one family um, that broke apart as a result of it. And another family or person that found like purpose and meaning. And it just painted this picture of like this, we, we tend to look outward at like, elite like navy seals and like the professional High athletes level, and like huge these are the people of of resilience and you read this book and you're just like man like it's it's the normal people it's the people going through and finding ways to to find purpose mm -hmm. uh in like the everyday stuff and it's a book that i've always taken with me uh and i reflect on it often yeah. uh as i think about you know challenges that come up in, in my day to day mm -hmm. um it, it's a weird place to find inspiration from but it's that it's the simple things um not always the big grand things it's like how you get through the day sometimes i love that um, and that book that book really inspired me um the second thing that i would say um there's a gentleman 
uh, whose name was James Stockdale. He was a Vietnam, um, he was a vet, he was a Navy pilot in Vietnam. Okay. Um, and he was shot down and he was a prisoner of war for a number of years. Mm -hmm. um, and in this interview, uh, the, in a book called Good to Great, they asked him, um, like, who didn't make it out? Um, yeah. And he said, oh, that's easy. The optimists. Oh. And the guy was like, huh? Like the optimists? Um, and he said, you know, it was the people that said we'd be out by Christmas. Oh. We'll be out by Easter. We'll be out. And he said, you, you know, you can, and I'm going to paraphrase it and not do it really well. I suggest you look it up, but it's, it's never losing hope for the end of the story. Um, and always finding, being brutally honest with your current situation. And this is what it is, but I know at the end of this, I will prevail and I'm going to use this whole experience mm -hmm. to be a better person and propel me forward. Um, so while those are like very different types of things, like it's the same theme Yes. where I find inspiration and in like finding people and situations where, where other people would quit and they'd have every good reason yes. to quit, but somehow find a way through and you see it in every, really every area of life. If, if you look for it, I love that. I love that very much. <clears throat> well, I'm so glad you're here. And early on, when I was creating my interview wish list, you were one of the first people who popped into mind uh, when I was thinking about starting this podcast, because I've been so inspired by, again, your collective journey, um, your ability to motivate others um, to be their best, and your genuine passion for helping others also. And I just always feel like if I've been fortunate enough to feel any ripple effect of your efforts, um, then other people ought to know about it too. So I want to jump right in here and have you tell us about Back on My Feet and how you ended up on Skid Row. Yes, um, <laughs> working on Skid Row. Um, oh, I so actually <laughs> felt like we should quantify that. <laughs> Helping? Yeah, um, yeah it, it, was, it was really interesting. It was actually when um, Devin and I, my wife, were, were living in Manhattan. I, I got connected to Back on My Feet which was an organization that really combined all of, all of my passions at the time, right? Um, so what the organization does is set up running teams at different organizations. So homeless shelters, uh, re-entry programs for people getting out of prison, substance mm -hmm. abuse programs. Um, and we set up running teams and run fi at 5.30 in the morning, three days a week with the individuals in those programs. Okay. And then we also bring in volunteers from the community. Um, so picture, you know, in the not so great areas of Manhattan to places like Skid Row in LA, just a group of people, all different types of people from all different walks of life getting together mm -hmm. and just running. Uh, and the power in that community uh, was just was super cool. And, you know, from there, we would do a lot more work with those individuals, help them find jobs, okay. um, help make connections, help do, you know, different trainings. But the change in, and a lot of that came from, from just being part of that community. And so starting in New York City in that program, then moving out to LA, I had to lay down the foundation right. of the program in LA. So they're just launching there. So going out, meeting different um, potential partners, programs, and I'll never forget the first time I was down on Skid Row. Um, you know, I'd been in some rough areas. Um, and I got down at Skid Row. I was like, there's no way. Uh, oh. Like it was like, there, there, it was like three in the afternoon. Oh my and it was crazy. And I was like, how am I ever going to get anybody down here at really? 530 in the morning? Let in alone the dark? yourself to keep going. Yeah. Like this is, um, this wow. is something. And um you know, people, people surprise you. you uh, people want to help. People mm -hmm. do want to be out there. And, you know, people in these programs, it's not easy for them to get up at 530 in the morning. And run. it's not like they got a lot of other, they got a lot of bigger fish to fry right. uh, often with, with things that they're working on. But um, love, love the work, love the program and, and everything that it involved in it. I love that idea too of, you know, when you, when you level set and you put everybody in a pair of shoes on the side of the road, 
everybody can move, you know, like you have different abilities, you have different interest levels, you have people who've got vastly different backgrounds, but you can all come together and have this common ground of not just something to do, but it's, it's healthy also, and it's motivating and inspiring. And we all feel better when we're working out anyway. Um, yeah. And then, like you said, you add in these volunteers, um, that whole component, it's just a beautiful combination of all those things together. Yeah. And you know, that was something that we, we had often talk a lot about, right? Like as you're standing there in a group, mm -hmm. you may not know who is who, which one's a volunteer, which one's somebody in the program, oh, somebody could be an executive, in a hoodie and a hat and exactly. you know and sort and not know standing next to somebody you know that's a in in one of these programs and it was a it was an equalizer of sort because okay. it doesn't matter how much money you have when you get to that starting line right it comes down exactly. to what you got and who um, showed up <laughs> and who showed up and so it, it really was this this equalizer of sorts it's beautiful to get everybody on the same page. Cause it's hard, right? Yeah. It's hard to run. You've run, uh, oh, yeah. you know, I've run, it's hard. Um, I mean, you're not so out there loving so every heart of it. I mean, every minute it's like, no. what am I doing? <laughs> yes. I've, I've, there hasn't been a race that I've stepped to the starting line and not said, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Yet you continue to go and yeah, do this. <laughs> certain, certain level of crazy. So, Tim Mann from South Buffalo, one of chi one of five children, excuse me, um, you enlist in the Marine Corps. Did you grow up wanting to serve in the military? I, I couldn't remember. Did you have veterans in the family? And then my mind just keeps going, okay, but he did like the Marines. I mean, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and I just feel like this set the stage um, for you for just what would end up being a lifetime of serving others or positioning yourself. Um, to help people better serve themselves, which is exactly what you're doing. Um, can you just like launch us into how we signed up for the Marines, please? Yeah. Okay. Well, so, <laughs> so, so it's funny because, so I grew up South Buffalo is a, an Irish Catholic working class neighborhood uh, in Buffalo. So I grew up going to Catholic schools mm -hmm. and growing up the, the nuns, um, used to call me Father Tim. Uh, they they used to say that I was going to be a priest. Um, oh, that was real nice of them. Yeah, I really showed. Was it really wishful showed thinking. <laughs> so, so when I was young, I wanted to be a priest, a fireman, and I wanted to be in the army. So, like the this idea of like being in the military was just always kind of in my mind. Maybe a priest in the army. I, I didn't really have it all figured out then. Um, I didn't know that. I so it was in my mind. So as I got older, moved farther away from the priest route, um, <laughs> and the, the military side was always in my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, after high school, I went to college and um, got into ROTC oh, okay. uh, for the army. Um, so to be an army officer, started doing that program got one of my good buddies who is my roommate into the program as well. Um, some people are ready for college. Other people are not. Okay. Um, I was not one of those people. Mm -hmm. uh, I found myself my sophomore year um, banned from all of the dorms, oh, man. Um, kicked out of everything um, and really a bit directionless on okay. what I was going to do. Mm -hmm. Um, so in thinking I, you know, I just lost a, an army scholarship, um, mm -hmm. to pay for my college and that was going to be the route I was going to go. So, so I took a step back and was like, well, if anybody could help me get my act together, um, I imagine it would be the Marines. Um, <laughs> yeah. So so I signed up, uh, and this was um, not long after September 11th. So it was probably about six months after. So oh, the world geez. was just in, like in a very upside down. Um, so, yeah. So the September 11th, and then I enlisted in. I was supposed to leave in January. Got arrested uh, for getting into a fight and. My recruiter had to go to court with me um, so that I could go to the Marines. So that delayed me because me and my buddy were going to go together. Okay. Um, so he went about two months before me and then I joined. And 
um, it was one of those experiences that I, I understood it and I learned a lot while I was there, but a lot of it also like once I got out is actually oh. when a lot of it started to really kind of oh, wow. come together for me. Right. So, you know, I went to the Marines to, to get my act together, to, to not drink as much, to not get into fights and get into trouble. Mm-hmm. Turns out that there's also a lot of that in the Marines. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> what have thought. Um, okay. but, but there's also a lot of, great friends. There's also a lot of great leaders. There's also a lot of hardship and working together and getting out of hardship. And there's a lot of routine and it really set the stage for me. Um, you know, it wasn't one of those things that was an immediate change. It wasn't, I didn't fall in love with it immediately. I wasn't like every minute was awesome. It wasn't, um, repeatedly, (laughs) but obviously, but, but yeah, it, 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 it's something that continued to kind of build and grow, you know, while I was in, but also even more so, I think, once I got out. Okay. Um, I guess I, this is probably a nice segue into, uh, you said there's a lot of routine. There was a, obviously a lot of physical work, um, level of expectation that way. You know, so you're out of the Marines and, you know, back to regular life. At some point, you decide you're going to become a marathon runner and and not just runner but competitive legit marathon runner um and then your ultra marathon i think you did correct yes so that tenacious attitude to understatement of the year um must have fueled this passion also for never giving up on yourself of course or as you say on the greater good so you know how did you wake up one day and now now we're going to be a marathoner you know it's um it, it almost kind of was like that pretty quickly. And okay. yeah, like most of the, most of the, like the big life decisions I've made have been come from like weird situations. So, um, <laughs> I, love that. I was not, I was not always a runner, um, at all. Uh, I was a nice hockey goalie growing up. Um, I went out for cross country my freshman year in high school. I quit after the first day. I was like, this sucks. Oh. Like this is miserable. Like, okay would ever do this for fun um it just it wasn't wasn't what i was into but i'll go do 30 miles yeah so, <laughs> yeah. so so in the marines i had to run um right. and then i just found like one that i i was good at it right i i wasn't necessarily putting in a lot of work and i was better than a lot of people just mm-hmm. naturally um and I had never really found that before okay. with anything else. It wasn't, I wasn't like a standout anything. I'd maybe stand out in my ability to go on a bender for yeah. two weeks, but like I, I wasn't really <laughs> stand out in a good. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> I, 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 just, <laughs> I was just never really that good at anything. And, and I saw it and even more than that, it was, I saw how I felt okay. um, and I saw how clear my head was. And I saw, uh, so that combination of like being good mm-hmm. and feeling good right. at the same time really kind of propelled me. So I continued to run in, in the Marines, not seriously, but then when I got out really kind of hit it hard, I was somebody that, that was, you know, fairly shy. I wouldn't really put myself out there. I got out of the Marines. Went back to community college, got, got my grades up for a semester or two, and then um, moved to Brooklyn to mm-hmm. go to college. Um, and I said, you know, I'm going to run on the cross country team at, at Brooklyn College. Uh, so I went out and did really well. You know, those races were, uh, I want to say they were three miles. They weren't really long. Sure. We were doing longer runs in training. And then one day um, I was running in Prospect Park uh-huh. and uh, Prospect Park, three mile loop. Um, and I'd went around it and right as I came to the end, I was running along like the dirt path and I face planted, um, in front of like all these other people. And I was just like, well, I can't end, I can't I can't end now. I can't end on that note. So I went around two more times, or like, like 10 miles oh. and like, nobody was probably even looking at me. They're like this asshole. Oh. Um, <laughs> 
I, I ran 10 miles and, I, and that was my longest run. And it was just this, like, I didn't set out to run 10 miles. It was just like I face plan and my adrenaline was going. I was like, I can't end like this right. and just kept running. And then just as I continued to go, it was just, you know, if I could do, it really set the stage for me. If I can do this, yeah. if I can run three miles and I can run six miles, if I can run six miles, I can do 10 miles, I can do this, I can do that. Mm-hmm. But then it translated to all areas of my life, right? If I can do this in running, yeah. why can't I? get that job? Why can't I do this thing? Why can't I do that? And I never had that mentality, like never had that mentality before. And it all really started from running. Mm -hmm. And then that's what you became good at. That's what I became good at. Not just the running, but how you were able to apply that same, like you figured out what made you tick and you were able to apply that across all the spectrums of your life, which I think that's incredible. The wherewithal, the self-awareness is Remarkable, I think. <laughs> yeah, I was, I, I was just, you know, I was lucky to come across it. Okay. But then it really was, you know, as you know, with running, mm-hmm. I, I'm an endurance runner. I, I like the longer stuff. I hate the first three miles. Yeah. I hate it. Uh, I hate the first five miles usually. And it, it's miserable. Yeah. But it's just like, I had to run farther to get past that to be like, ah, like, now I get it. Had you now I feel leave. right. So it's just, I wasn't, I wasn't doing enough. Oh, that's wild. Um, to, to get to the other side of the good, sure, right? Like sure. I, if I only ever stayed in that three miles and that's not to say that there's a lot of good on the other side of 50 miles for everybody, <laughs> I <was gonna> say. <laughs> but, but for me, that's what it was on the other side of that, like initial discomfort. Uh-huh. And it's a theme in my life. I'm not to get through that initial discomfort, there's always something better on the other side. Right. And to know that you have to give it time to get through the hurt. Like you're not going to hit stride until you're supposed to hit stride. And if you quit bailing early, you'll just never grow and you'll never figure it out. Um, And yeah, that's exactly it. It's it's not always supposed to feel good. Um, Right. Sometimes the good. Exactly. Comes later. Well, okay. So when you're working with um, inmates at Reichert's and the residents at Back on My Feet, I'm just thinking about this, obviously this topic of giving up and not giving up. Um, But when you're speaking about um, people in those sorts of communities, obviously abandonment is a word that comes to to my mind and maybe something that many of these people have in common. Abandonment abandonment looking like lack of support, um, giving up. I guess my question, if you're, if you're able, and I know you've, cause I've seen you do this, but if you are able to crack a person's shell and actually get through, have you ever been able to find out what changes for people along the way? Like, is there a common message or story that speaks to these abandonment things and how we can refocus that energy? Yeah, it's, you know, it's. I wouldn't say that there's a common thing, right? Because everybody's coming from something different, Um, you know, different trauma, different life situations, different, different things. What I would say is that um, people feeling respected, Mm -hmm. people feeling cared for, Mm -hmm. um, people feeling part of something, something good. goes a very long way for people. And that's been a key part of the work that I did in that space was kind of creating this community so that people can feel that, right? Yeah. It, it, oftentimes, you know, people coming from, you know, underserved backgrounds um, and being in jail and being in these programs, they haven't felt it, right? They really haven't had that positive influence and somebody to believe in them, okay. somebody to say, actually, like there isn't, there could be another way. And it's not even that oftentimes, you know, these individuals are, are choosing not to see another way. Oftentimes they don't even, they're just, they've never been exposed to another way. They don't even know the option. Um, they, they don't even know the option, right? And that was always what I saw my work as was just like, helping people see options right. um, that they could have. Choices. So, mm-hmm. so as you think about like people changing over time, it, it's as people start to start to feel the trust, yeah. start to feel that. 
and also allow themselves to feel that because that could be hard, right? It's hard to trust people. It's mm-hmm. hard, especially when you've had to live a life where you didn't really have anybody to trust. And you've been burned uh, and had people turn their backs on you and everything yeah, else. Yeah, all of it. Right. So, so as people start to let that in, um, it's you, you see the change and you see people then start to f- start to really see those other options and connect with people to, to get there. Can you think of one person who's, you know, in these wonderful moments that you in hard moments that you've had, who has reverse motivated you? Anyone who's just kind of, we talk about these aha moments, right? Especially when we're caring for others and um, any, can you think of anyone who's ever brought you to your knees with that aha moment? Yeah, I think um, there, there's been a lot of hard cases. There's also been, you know, a, a number of good ones. And I think the, you know, and just to comment on like the reverse motivated, I would, I would, I was constantly inspired, motivated, and learning from everybody. I'll never forget sitting at at Rikers Island in my first group session that I was doing, surrounded by thirty inmates in plastic chairs in the day room and just me there to run a group. And it was like, Oh shit. Like, I don't know. I don't really know that much. Um, so it was a constant education, constant learning, constant learning about other people and also just constantly learning about myself. Uh Um, but one of the people that sticks with me and also because I'm connected with her on social media, um uh, there's a woman named sandra uh mm. from back on my feet she was in a long beach uh in california long beach veterans program she had been in the navy years back uh and i'll share her story because she she's public about it just okay. a little bit of it uh, but she had um substance abuse issues been homeless uh hadn't really been a runner like hadn't been physically active since her time in the military and was just really, really down and out. Uh, So she joined the program at Long Beach and we started running together. Uh, And I would always do my run after Um, I ran with the group. I would was training, so I had to do more competitive runs. So I would run after and Sandra tended to be in the back. So I'd kind of hang out with Sandra. We would do a walk run and she just had this positivity and this, this energy about her that Mm. she was going to do it. Um, and I'd seen that before and I've seen a lot of people not do it. A lot of things come up, a lot of, a a lot of things happen. And as it turned out, most of the people she started that program with Mm -hmm. ended up dying, uh, from police assisted suicide, overdoses, alcohol, um, wow. the group that we all ran with almost everybody that she started with passed away, oh uh, gosh. from one of those things, but Sandra made it. Um, and she continues to run every oh, wow. day. She, she is now a volunteer at programs, goes back to these shelters to run with people. Incredible. Uh, she has a full-time job at the VA. Oh. She has her own house. She has her own car. Um, Sandra did and it. has just, and she did it and she did it all the way and she did it in the style um, that would only be her oh, and her personality um, but against a million odds right she but the thing with her was that she kept showing up mm-hmm. she would show up every Monday every Wednesday every Friday any extracurricular thing that we did she was there and it was that community. She's now part of running groups on her own. And it's, I couldn't speak for her, but this community that she gained and this self-confidence that she was able to build up from running it and being connected with all of these people, Mm -hmm. um, it just, it put her on a path. That's and and I see her post that she just ran the New York city marathon. Oh my gosh. Um, I love this. that's, it just doesn't get doesn't get better. That's good news, right? Like that's exactly everybody needs to hear a story like that, like Sandra. I mean, that is yes. that's incredible. But like you said, and it could have gone a number of ways, but the bottom line was she showed up and everything after oh, that, yeah. she was already there. 
So yeah, it's like the hardest showing part of the day. The hardest part. Exactly. It's a showing up the hardest part to, 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 to wake up in a shelter oh. and get up in the dark and walk downstairs at 30 in the morning by yourself meeting strange. Like it's just, yeah. it's not easy, especially with the past and the history and, and things that people have gone through, but she did it and she kept doing it. And I love her story. Thank you for sharing yeah. that. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I like she, that a lot. I, every time I see her posts, I'm, I'm inspired and it's just a daily reminder mm-hmm. of, um, what keep showing up can do. Exactly. Well, it's amazing um, how you've made a career out of people, meeting people at their, at their zero, meeting people at the bottom, if you will, um, prison, jail, literally walking and sometimes running beside people who are so fresh out and so fresh with this opportunity zero, where, as you said, it's so easy to go back um, it's so easy to be directed negatively back to bad habits, bad choices, back to jail, back to prison. Um, besides being an incredible metaphor for living an emphatic life and being sometimes the single person who can help bring a person up from the trenches, how do you stay motivated, Tim? Because this feels like it could get heavy. Um, yeah. How do you stay motivated? How do you stay inspired to stay the course for yourself, but you know you're serving others? And that's a tall order. Yeah. Yeah. It's like everybody else. Some days are better than others. Um, I'm, I'm definitely not, I'm definitely not always good at it. Um, but the thing that I am, if nothing else is consistent, Mm -hmm. um, that no matter how I feel, um, I get up and I run or I go to the gym I do because, and again, that's me. That's not everybody. That's every, that's my passion. Right. It's my thing. No, it's, it's how just you like, stay inspired. I know that it feeds my soul mm-hmm. uh, in, in a way. Um, so I keep showing up and, and I keep showing up um, for a couple of reasons. One is I constantly remind myself of when I didn't have that. Okay. And what that felt like and what it looked like for my life. Um and it wasn't good and it wasn't positive and I felt like crap, uh, physically, emotionally, mentally. Um, and I don't ever want that again. Right. Um, I've, I know what it is to feel good. Right. And part of that is, you know, the exercise in the morning, but part of it is also connecting with people, mm-hmm. um, in, in a real way. And it's something, again, when I was in that stage of my life, not something I was doing. So, you know, through physical fitness, through running, through working out, uh, through my family, right. um, seeing my kids, tr- making sure that, you know, I'm the dad that I want my kids to see, right. uh, and that I want them to, to look to and be the husband and the father and the son. Um, I'm just, I'm constantly aware of, of those things. And, mm-hmm. And as I've done, and I always reflect on my work that I've, I've done in the, the nonprofit space, and also, you know, helping people find hope, see hope yeah. in those situations, you know, then I also wanted to see the other end of it. So I started volunteering with hospice um, to find hope in that last, or meaning in the last component. Right. So it's just like from early on through the work, through the miles, through, Mm -hmm. through the volunteering, through all these things. I just like, how could I not, how could I waste it? Yeah. Um, I just have so many reminders of so many situations where it would be a shame Hmm. to waste it. And I've had too much experience and, and seen what there is to lose, uh, if you don't stay on top of it. And how long it can take to build that runway. And, yeah. you know, like the, you think about like the onboarding of getting yourself finally all squared away and set on the, on the course. Right. And you, ever so slightly wavering in the beginning, kind of like bailing before mile three, when you need to get to mile six, such a shame yeah. to lose all of that ground you've covered. 
Um, but it isn't, yeah. it's almost feels exponential. Like the longer you've been working on it, you can't abandon this now. It's taken yeah, it's, much too far to come here. And that's exactly it. And I would say that the other, the other component of it is designing a life that makes it easy to make those decisions. Um, because if you got to make that decision every day, right. it's hard. Right? I love that uh, notion of designing your life. Like we are, you have a tattoo that says I'm something on my ship. What is your? Um, I'm the master of yes. my fate and I'm the captain of my soul. I love that. But it also puts just a really nice amount of responsibility in each of our laps. Like I'm the architect here of my own happiness, of my own choices, of my own life. And like to lose step of that, the longer you've been in charge of it, it just sounds like, oh. So demoralizing. <laughs> well, I, and that's it. Like I, I'm not. It, if I go away on vacation, it's way harder for me to get up, put my shoes on, exactly. and get out. If I'm in my environment, totally. I've designed my day. I wake up, I go downstairs, I do this, I do that, I do that. Like it's all a routine. But I've designed that routine so that I'm not making a choice because I know what choice I want to make. So now I've designed a life right. that's going to set me up for success. I love that make those decisions because if I had to choose every day, am I going to work out? It's too hard. You don't want to, I don't want to do it ever. There's I want to sit on the couch. I want to watch a movie. Things. Like I just, I don't want to do it, but I know I need to do it. So I've designed a life that pushes me down that path uh, that. every day because otherwise it, 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 it's easy to, to forget it. Right. So you, you, you reflect uh -huh. a, a lot of reflection and designing a life that, that, that makes it easy. That makes it work. When did you realize your efforts might be useful in the corporate world, not just Rikers Island or Skid Row, but maybe you could also serve prison and people, um, you know, starting back at step one, but also translate this to an everyday person, mid-level career or beyond who may be in need of motivation also. Yeah. So when I, you know, being a nonprofit, I was working a lot in the corporate space. Um, and I knew nothing about that world. Nothing. I, I went from South Buffalo to the Marines to the to Rikers Island. Like I knew nothing about it. Um, I didn't even know where Silicon Valley was. Right. Like I did. I thought that was like a ski play. Like I didn't know. I didn't know anything <laughs> about it. Um, just had no idea. And it was there was just a gap of, you know, a couple of gaps. There was a, there, there was a gap of, you know, having a family and like, now what do we need to do to support it? Mm -hmm. But how do I also continue to, to find work that I passionate about? I was never anybody that was just right. going to punch a clock and do something that I didn't care about doing. It just wasn't, it wouldn't get me out the door in the morning. Um, so through um, a, a mutual friend got connected with an employee well-being software company. Oh, I actually, awesome. the woman that hired me at that company, uh, she's now the CEO and founder of the company I'm currently at, which is a, a digital coaching uh, oh, platform. Awesome. So to provide one-on-one -on -one coaching with individuals in companies all the way up through executives. That's amazing. So my path in the corporate world has all been employee well-being, you know, recognizing people, um, coaching, mm -hmm. um, things I, things I care about because there's, there's impact to be had. There's work to be done. There's a hundred percent. It's about the stories. It's about the good news, right? Yeah. Like the work that I do now, we see the quotes I and know. we see like change my life. And it's just like, and I think you want to work for a company that does that a hundred percent. But I think even more poignant now, given the last two years that we've gone through, just, you know, as, as humans, but also maintaining this, you, you got to keep working. Like you're working at home now. A lot of people are juggling so many things. I can't think of a more perfect time to have someone like you on my team, you know, um, keeping people motivated and keeping people inspired. And cause we've got a lot on our plates sometimes, you know, um, it seems so beneficial. Wow. It's like, how did we ever survive without people like you <laughs> in the corporate space? I, I, is I, I would say it's not so much people like me. It, it's it's the companies that are out there to to give to give, to give those options. Yeah, okay. Give the options, I right? It. it goes back to like providing options because 
not everybody knew coaching was a thing, right? right. But now all uh, professional athletes, all the top, like everybody has one, right? You, you see it in the news, you mm -hmm. see it at the Olympics, you see it everywhere. Um, because at the end of the day, that's what it comes down to, right? It's designing your life. It's, it's building those routines. It's building the confidence and doing those things that, that we all need. And then we all struggle with it different right. times. Well, what would you say to someone who says, I can't, like, I can't do that. I can't help them. I don't have enough time for that. Blah, blah, blah. Start small. Um, That's my favorite. And, you know, when I was, yeah, there's, there's a, there's a different podcast, not to compete with your podcast. It's okay. Um, <laughs> it's, there's it's, a few it's, others. It's a, it, there's, there's a relationship compact, co um, podcast that I've, I haven't even listened to. I probably should. Um, <laughs> and it's called, um, it's called small things often. Mm. Um, and I love that, right? Because it is those I small things. And it's about, you know, what, you know, I would tell somebody about working out, just like put, get up and put on your sneakers, walk around your house yeah, and see if you want to go. Right. But like find the smallest thing, right. If you want to help somebody like Find the small, say a nice thing uh, to somebody. When when I worked at Rikers and would run groups with inmates, it was when we talked about kind of being a different type of person, it was put the toilet seat up when you're in a public restroom when you pee. Start um, small. Start small. But it's just like, literally. Yes. But it's like but when you get in the habit of doing those things, it changes then who you are as a person, I because like now you're the type of person that puts your grocery cart away. You're the type of person that's thinking about the next person. So you're not going to pee all over the seat, exactly. right? Like these are small things, but when you start to do it, it builds that habit and it builds that muscle. And before you know it, like you have a different outlook. I love that so much. Okay. So the good news is I'm just in summation here. We need people. <laughs> And so often people think they can't, people think they're insignificant. People think they're at their lowest. People can't get a second chance or they don't know where to start. Um, the real news is that we can all get stuck. We can get into trouble. We can fall out of sync with our own step, but I feel like there's good news on either side of the fence here, uh, because I really believe that if you're on the stuck side, the good news is that it's still not game over. Like you're here, you have choices to make. We kind of talked about that earlier. Like you have a choice and you can start small. Um, so you have choices to make, but hey, at least you have some choices to make. Um, if you're on the other side of the fence and you happen to be a helper, um, maybe having been on both sides of the fence yourself, maybe not. The good news here is you get to roll up your sleeves and help. You get to share, listen, you should climb back over that fence and sit with the stuck, as I like to say. And then you bring them back up out of there. <laughs> and that's a whole lot of good news, um, if you ask me. I don't know if you agree. I think you do. <laughs> be, be a Sandra. Um, be, yes, be the be person that when you go, when you talk about going back over the fence, um, uh, as soon as you said that, it's like, that's what I think of. Somebody... Um, that finds the opportunity and then it goes back to make sure that everybody else has that same opportunity. I love it. Okay. It's the moment we've all been waiting for. <laughs> this is my um, rapid fire question round. All right. So it's the same questions, but you don't know what they are. I do not know what they are. I purposely did not listen to the last one because I didn't want to know. Okay, that's true. I guess I didn't listen. Catch on. <laughs> but okay. I didn't re-listen to the last okay. one. Thank you. So I, I listened to it and then, but you know then what, I, I actually have no idea what the questions are. Even if you did, it's okay, because everybody's going to have their own answers. So they're kind of short and sweet answers. Um, okay, question number one. What smell do you love? Oatmeal and peanut butter and cinnamon. I'm shocked. What smell do you hate? Um, cilantro. What's your favorite feature of yourself? Um that I keep showing up. What's your least favorite feature? That I'm not as consistent. My least favorite feature would be my confidence. What do you appreciate most in your friends? 
honesty and humor. What is your main fault? That I can be extreme on all ends. What shape is the sky? Rectangle, hands down. We had a sneak preview on that one, your wife told us. <laughs> what is your biggest fear? My biggest fear is that I stop showing up and I go backwards. What word keeps you going? Purpose. I love that. I love you, Tim. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. I'm so glad you could come. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah. Feel very grateful to be part of your good news. That makes me feel really good. I'm trying. I just feel like we there's we need it. There's no yes. shortage right now. There's a big shortage. There's no shortage there's of shortage. people who yes. don't need to hear this. Um, all right. Well, we hope you enjoyed the Good News is podcast today, and I hope. You heard my friend Tim's message and you felt it in your gut and in your heart. And I hope you feel compelled to answer um, some kind of calling, whether it's to meet a complete stranger where they are and lift them up from their level zero, or maybe meet them on the path of their first steps back at starting anew. Or maybe Tim's experiences resonate with you in a way where you can finally figure out how to meet a family member or someone in your life who, for whatever reason, is now down and out and needs someone anyone to just help them get going, to give them good news. And maybe that someone is you. And I'm not, I always like to say, I'm not in the arm twisting business, <laughs> but I encourage you and I'm rooting for you. If you don't already follow Tim on Instagram, he's at tim.man underscore. Be sure to go look him up and give him a follow. If you don't follow me, you can find me at the good news is podcast on Instagram or free range mama on Instagram. If you enjoyed your time with us today on the Good News Is podcast, we'd love if you could subscribe, rate with five stars if you would, <laughs> and leave a review. Um, obviously, if you have any questions or um, ideas for topics, you can send us a direct message on Instagram. So thanks again for tuning in to the Good News Is podcast. We could all use a positive nudge, a friendly hug, or a pat on the back. And we all need more good news. I can promise you that. So thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. And have a beautiful day. <laughs> Thank you. Okay.